close to each other. The ego is still manifesting most of the time. The consciousness is still bottled up in the ego. And we basically dance to the tune of the puppet master, the ego, as it manifests in the various five centers. Uh, and unfortunately, the majority of humanity spends their time switching between these two states. And we've all experienced this too, where we've been awake, you know, and we're doing something really boring or really having that monotonous day at work, and we almost start to transition into that sleep state. We might be doing something, but our mind starts to wander, we kind of shift off. We really spend the whole time transitioning between those two states, and if that's the basement, that's the first story. But it turns out that there's other levels above the state of Acacius and the state of Pistis. The third state is the state of Dianoia, and that's the self-conscious state. And we're going to talk about these in detail. So the next higher state above what we're in right now is a different state, a state where the consciousness becomes more active, becomes more aware of the state that it's in, and that's the state of Dianoia. That's the third floor of the house. And then the top of the house is the state <coughs> of Noose, and that is the state of objective, sorry, objective consciousness, the state of perfect illumination. And that's what we're all striving to reach. And as I mentioned, we normally switch between these two states. When we start to practice, work with things like self-observation and self-remembering, we can get glimmers of what it's like to be in this state. And then when we finally get a good solid ground in this state, we can get glimmers of what it's like to be in this state. And then finally, when we reach this state, we're at the state of the, the awakened master, the state of a perfect illumination. So it's you know, different as we are from uh, an awakened master. As far as levels of consciousness go, we're really not that separated. There's only about four levels of consciousness. Of course, to go from here to here requires a, a lot of effort, a lot of work on our part. Uh, Ikazia is the state of consciousness we find ourselves in where we sleep. And as I mentioned, when we go to bed every night, this is the state that we shift down into. It's a lower state of consciousness than where we occupy right now. Because when we go down to Ikazia, that's where all those hidden egos submerge. That's where we really find ourselves uh, facing a lot of the, the darker egos. It's a really um, instinctive kind of lower state of existence. Uh, consequently, it's referred to as a dream state governed by the instincts, because it's basically almost pure ego that we see down there, with the exception, of course, of when we experience lucid dreams or other astral experiences. Most of the time, it's the ego, all the various egos manifesting and projecting simultaneously, which is why we see that bizarre, crazy uh, images and disjointed things that happen to us while we sleep. In this state of consciousness, we find ignorance, cruelty, profound sleep, an infrahuman state. We look at all of that stuff, the ignorance, the cruelty, the darker side of man, we look at that as all uh, um, perversions of the instincts that the ego uses, right? Remembering that the instincts basically came with us from the animal kingdom, but then the ego gets a hold of us. For example, lust is a perversion of the instinct to breed. Uh, gluttony is a perversion of the instinct to feed. Um, Violence and acts of aggression are just perversions of the instinct to defend oneself. Uh, you know, fear basically and phobias being perversions of the instinct to, you know, fight or flight, that kind of thing. Be afraid of the, the big scary things with the sharp teeth that could come after us and eat us. Uh, in the lower state of consciousness that we find ourselves in, in Akazia, that's referred to as an infrahuman state. It's a state that is, as far as levels go, it's the bottom of the barrel, it's the bottom rung of the ladder. And that's the state we find ourselves in while we sleep. That's why there's so much of that kind of imagery in dreams. That's why psychologists and psychiatrists really want to talk to us about our dreams to get an idea of what's happening in this state. Because those are where those lower egos uh, manifest. And those are the egos that are hidden. The ones that are in the dark side of our psychology. And they call a lot of the shots. They pull a lot of the strings at a really subconscious level that we're not even aware of. That's why self observation becomes such an important tool because you initially, you're like the layers of an onion, right? You initially see the eagles that are on the surface, but when you start peeling layer after layer, you start to go deeper and deeper into your own psychology and get an idea about what really makes you tick. And uh, in the dream state, that's why our dreams can be important tools for understanding psychology because in our dreams we see eagles manifesting that we're not even conscious of during the waking state. That's why keeping that dream diary is good to help trigger lucid dreaming, but it also can give us an insight into self-observation by studying what happens in our dreams and getting an idea of what kind of uh, instinctual egos might be manifesting. 
The physical body sleeps, but we know the ego is wrapped up in the lunar bodies and becomes like a sleepwalker moving about in the astral world. Remember that we have the physical body, we have the vital body, which is the fourth dimensional aspect, but then in addition to that we have the lunar astral body and the lunar mental body. Remember that the lunar bodies are inferior versions of the solar bodies, they're basically a, a tool of the ego. If the lunar body uh, it was the analogy of a you know, canoe with a lot of holes in it, the solar body would be the luxurious ocean liner. There are inferior vehicles and vessels that we have in the higher dimensions, and they're primarily used by the ego. The ego projects its dreams and lives in them. We see oftentimes in our dreams there's no logic, there's no continuity of purpose whatsoever, in random haphazard images, things come and go, it's really hard to put together, because that's basically all the ego. The ego's projecting that kind of stuff, so we experience that while it feeds off the various energies that we have. Uh, from this state, we remember vague subjective <coughs> images, incoherent scenes appearing and disappearing upon waking. That's a, a good portion of our dreams fall into that category. They're not, you know, linear. We can't really say this is how they started and this is how they progressed like a movie. It's just like a crazy movie with different scenes. Imagine you took, you know, 20 Hollywood <coughs> movies and randomly cut them all together. The characters keep changing, the scenes keep changing, the events keep changing. That's kind of the way our, our, our dreams go because you've got all these eagles that are trying to project different uh, scenes of different movies at the same time in order to, to uh, sustain themselves on the energies that are associated with the five centers. Uh, the next state we look at from Akasia, this is the state of Pistis, and this is the so-called waking state. This is the vigil state. But that's a, a really curious term to use, and we know the reason why that's in quotations is because that's misleading. We find our consciousness asleep during the day as well. And that's one of the strangest things to be human. Um, we think that we're awake, yet we're firmly asleep. And that's one of the, the, the strangest things. Uh, the state of pistis is a state of profound sleep governed by the five senses and the brain. Now, we learned this last week, right? The power of the five senses and that they really shape our reality uh, once they're funneled through the ego and passed on to the tiny bit of consciousness that we have. We learned last week with transformation of the impressions that everything that we see has basically been filtered through the ego. Our whole reality for us is defined by the peace to state, information gathered through the five senses, filtered by the lens of the ego, that then is what arises at our consciousness as being reality in the world around us. This is the level of consciousness of common humanity, and most of the humans walking around on this planet, this is the, the highest they ever get to. They get to the second story of that house, and they don't get to see anything beyond that. So their entire reality basically stops here. Their entire reality becomes a state of sleep, a state of lower consciousness that's governed and driven by the five senses in the brain. The reality become everything the five senses tell them, and they never really get to that point of objective consciousness. They're never really able to experience the truth, the reality around them, because they find themselves asleep. We're sleepwalkers that firmly believe that we're awake, and that's the problem. Everything we see before us is just an extension of the dreams that we have as well at night. The difference being, this is kind of a dream that we've all collectively agreed upon certain elements. So we're all to a certain extent sharing this dream that we perceive as reality. When we wake up in the morning, one interesting thing that happens, the ego returns to the body, the dream continues on in our interior. It's not like that dreaming ever really stops. It's just like it shifts to a more subconscious level. Those egos that we see at night are still manifesting, but they drop to a lower state. So they still control, manipulate, and influence what they do, but they're doing it at a lot more of a subconscious level. That's why, as I mentioned earlier, one of the interesting things about studying our dreams is we can also see the different egos that are manifesting. The egos that we see manifesting at night are still there. They're still part of us. They're still there during the day, but at the day, they slip a bit more into the background. They slip into the shadows where they still control and manipulate and predict what we do. But when we wake up in the morning, it's really just a, a different shift of the ego. The consciousness that we have isn't really that much different. Uh, we're aware of being in a different dimension because that's really what we're doing when we switch between waking and sleep. We're just shifting dimensionally. When we're asleep, we're wandering around. Our consciousness is trapped in the fifth dimension. During the day when we come, we're basically trapped in the three dimensions. But it's still the same idea. The ego still calls the shots. The consciousness still calls the sleep. 
uh, sorry, this consciousness is still asleep. So really the difference between being awake and being asleep is whatever dimension you happen to be in. And those things are so subtle, that's why we talk about, you know, pulling the finger, the discernment technique, trying to question where we are, to catch ourselves where we are dimensionally, because the consciousness is asleep, is asleep in both places. That's why it's so hard for us to realize when we're dreaming that we're dreaming, because as far as the consciousness is concerned, there's not really much of a difference between those two states. We live in a world of dreams and firmly believe that we're awake. We have to comprehend we are asleep. Only when one is aware that they are asleep can they enter onto the path of awakening. Now, this is a really interesting statement. Uh, how do you know the difference between being awake and being asleep? Because this morning you had a shift of consciousness where you realized that you were suddenly awake, you were no longer dreaming. There was a shift there. And you could take those experiences, that you, those memories that you have as dreams, you can go, wow, that was a crazy dream. And you can recognize that that wasn't real. You can recognize you have now shifted into a different state and are now, you know, dealing with a different set of dimensions. Something really interesting happens. When we start practicing on the path, sometimes we can get glimmers of the next state of consciousness. And that makes this feel like the dream. When we kind of poke our head above the clouds into the next story of the house, we can look back at this right here and we can go, wait a sec, I've now experienced what it was like to be awake. I can see that I was dreaming. I can see it was just a different level of dreaming. And that's something that we have to really strive for, and that's something that comes with self-observation, is the realization, a sudden, a sudden shift in consciousness where we can realize that this right now is a dream, and it suddenly feels like we're awake. And returning back here feels like falling back asleep, feels like we're falling back into the dream, and we have, the, we have something to measure it against. We firmly feel that we're awake because this is all that we know. We know two states. We know a coin with two sides. Are the heads or tails? And we can look at one and say, I'm in tails, therefore the other side is heads. And we can separate those two states of consciousness. Now, when you throw an experience of a third one into the mix, then you change things. Then you realize there's something more to life. There's something more to all of this stuff. That's why one of the big things on this path, we call it a conscious shock. Something that makes you just realize that you know, there's something different. There's something that's not right. There's something that's, that I really have to work towards. Part of the conscious shock on this path comes from understanding that this right now is just another state of sleep. This right now is just another state of dream. It's a different state of dreaming where we collectively have agreed upon many parts of the dream, but it's still a conscious state. Okay, It's still a state occupied with a lower level of consciousness. It's still a state dominated by the ego. And it's not until we experience another state that we can realize that. And I can spend the next hour talking about that, and that doesn't mean anything until you two can stick your head above the clouds, even if it's just for a few minutes during a meditation and go, wait a second, this is a different something. This is a different level, and what I just left feels like waking up, and when you return, it feels like going back to sleep. This state of consciousness is the world of belief and opinion. This is what we find in our society. This is the manifestation of living in, uh, most of humanity, living trapped in this state of consciousness. It's the state of belief and opinion, the state of prejudice, the state of theories, the state of fantasies, in which there does not exist any type of direct perception of the truth. We don't know any better because we don't know what it's like to be outside of that. We're asleep, yet we're firmly believe we're awake. So we have all these beliefs, opinions, and theories, and fantasies, and we don't really have any direct perception of the truth. We've all collectively agreed upon this illusion. We're all working to sustain this illusion together. We really don't know what exists outside of this. And that's why one of the big things on this path is before we can really enter on the path of awakening, before we can have some of these life-transforming uh, uh, moments that really <coughs> convince us that we have to work hard and have to strive for something else, before we get to that state, this is where we, this is where we are. And for many people, concepts like astral projection, other dimensions, it perhaps becomes a theory, it perhaps becomes something they believe, it might be an opinion that they have, but it's not something based on a direct perception of that being a reality. And that's why we have to strive for ourselves. Don't listen to what I say. Don't read it in books. We have to experience this for ourselves. Because when we experience it for ourselves, it's life transforming. It's a conscious shock. It's like a slap upside the head of the consciousness that makes you go, oh, wait a minute. Everything that I thought, I do was wrong. And I have to work to change this. And I have to work to make this better because I can see, I can see how good it could be. I can see how, how beneficial this could be if I work. One of the hardest things on the path 
is not having really, really ex any, sorry, not having any real experiences. That's the most difficult aspect because for a lot of the stuff that we talk about, you might accept it and want to believe it. You might, you know, have an opinion of your own or see it as an opinion of mine. You might have your own prejudices on what you think might be possible, and it really becomes just a theory. Perhaps you fantasize about, oh, wouldn't that be nice to do this or experience that? But in the end, you have to experience it for yourself. Because it's not until you experience it for yourself that you begin the path of awakening. Not until your eyes have been opened, and they can only open sometimes for a short period of time, and then they're closed again. But at least at one point they were open, and you're able to perceive the true reality, and then you strive to get that state again, to get that back to that level, to that point. And that brings us to what is it our eyes are opening to in that experience, what our eyes are opening to when we're in the state right now. If we enter the deep meditation or, or a practice right now and we had an experience, what our eyes might be opening to is the state of dianoia. And this is the state in which we become self-conscious. This is the state where our consciousness begins to activate. Before reaching this third state, one doesn't really know themselves, even though one may believe that they know themselves. Self-observation allows us to chip away a little bit at who we are. Remember that whole concept of nasate, ipsum, know thyself? That doesn't really happen until we get to this level. Because at this level we have the ability to create a separation between that, everything, that right there that I thought I was, that is ego, I am something different. What is active right now is something entirely different and you're able to look at the ego and that's why we call this a self-conscious state. It's a different level of awareness of who we really are. And that's what we mean by the, until you get a glimpse of this point, you don't really know uh, the full, what's I'm looking for? You don't really know the, the, the full package of what the ego is. You think about it, you might have spotted a few egos here and there. You hum and you haw, you wonder, you know, how much you know, really is going on with the ego and how much of this does, can I really experience and I'm not really sure, you know, you, know you, you might be aware of some egos manifesting when you're really angry, you're really upset, but when you're having a good time and everything's okay, you kind of forget about the whole ego consciousness thing because it doesn't bother you that much and you kind of slip into that lower state again. Before reaching this third state, we really don't know who we are. We may believe that we know who we are, you know, there's that concept of belief again. We have opinions and that kind of stuff. Some maybe experiences or observations to back it up, but nothing really concrete. This state of consciousness produces an intelligent revision of beliefs. This allows us to experience firsthand some of these types of things that we're talking about. And with these experiences comes what I mentioned earlier is that slap upside the head, the whole kind of, of tweak to a different reality where we can really compare. It's all about a vantage point. We know we were sleeping this morning because we have the vantage point of being awake and we can say this is different from that. When we go to another level, it's now a different vantage point. We've zoomed back out, we're able to see more of the complete picture. While we're inside ourselves at a lower level, we really can't see a lot of the egos. You know, let's say, uh, let's compare, you know, when you're walking around on street level in a city, let's say that's like being asleep. Let's say that's like when you're asleep at night. You can see people, you can see buildings from a lower level. Let's say the state of peace, this is like going up a story or two. You can now see more people around the corner, you can see more, you can see more stores, you can see more of a vantage point. The state of Dianoia would be like going to the top of a skyscraper, where suddenly you can see the full picture, you can see the entire city and your position in it. It's all about changing vantage points, if you think of it that way. Vantage points of the consciousness. From this level, we were able to zoom back out and look at things from a different vantage point, a different scale, which allows us to really see all of the egos. Where when we're on street level, we might see a few people around us, the ones we bumped into in the street, you know, you guys I can see in this room. I go up, stand on top of Wolfgang's house, I might see a few more people around the block, a few more houses. I zoom up to the, you know, a couple hundred feet, I can see the entire city of London and everybody in there. That's the same kind of idea. When we go higher to these levels of consciousness, we're able to become aware of larger and larger things. Once we get to this level, we're basically able to see ourselves as an entire package and all the egos that, that encompass that. Because of that experience, it brings about an intelligent revision of beliefs. We start to, to take some of the things that we think, uh, that we might have theorized about or experimented with, and they start to become truths for us. We start to verify things. They start to become things that then really um, define our reality. We're basing it on experience. 
This state is precisely remembering ourselves, precisely remembering our inner being, the state of self-remembering, which allows us to not identify with our egos. This is a difficult thing to describe. Um, you will reach this state through self-observation, which <coughs> triggers an aspect of self-remembering. Okay, because remember, self-observation is splitting ourselves in the, into the observer and observed. From that state of self-observation, we're able to culminate that relationship with our consciousness. We can start identifying with our consciousness that allows us to self-remember. We can start putting our efforts, our awareness on the consciousness and not the ego because we've been able to make a separation between the two. Does that make sense? From the state of self-remembering, we can trigger the state of dianoia. Um, let me try to describe this to the best that I can. I mean, the first time this happened to me, I was at my desk typing at work, doing some mundane, boring data entry stuff. And I was chosen that moment to self-observe. And because I was self-observing, I was directing or trying to direct a lot of attention onto to my consciousness, saying, OK, I'm watching myself. What am I doing while I'm sitting here typing? And I'm thinking about this. And this thought just came in, just like I'd been doing many times before, just regular old self-observation. And because I've been getting good at self-observation, I was putting a lot, being able to put a lot more strength to my consciousness. So my consciousness was starting active, and rather than blaming the ego, I was being able to, able to relate more to the consciousness, the observer, rather than the observed. And all of a sudden, there I am typing at work, and the next thing I know, I, it, I have this shift. That's all I can describe it. A sudden, really curious state of awareness, where I was able to view my body almost like a... It wasn't an out-of-body experience in that I could see myself sitting there typing, like astral projection would be. It was a different state of consciousness where it was almost like my body didn't belong to me. It was like a foreign, it was like a machine. And suddenly I was able to see the relationship between the egos and the physical body. Seeing it was the egos doing the typing with the motor center. I could see, I perceive the different thoughts being generated by the ego. It was almost like I was pulled out of myself and able to see a lot more completely of who I was. Rather than having the perspective of inside me, I had the perspective of outside of me, not being part of the ego, caught in the mess, but suddenly being completely separate from it. And it lasted, I don't know, maybe two, three minutes, and there I was back in the physical body, but it had that switch. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, what the hell just happened there? And realized that I've been able to see something from a different level. And coming back to the physical body felt a lot like going to, so I had to stop work for the afternoon. It felt like I'd fallen back to sleep. It felt like slipped back into the dream, but now I knew it was the dream. And I felt like what I'd been able to see, that was the reality. And there I was typing some mundane stuff at work, and it seemed so pointless, so silly, so I was worried about something. I had a, something bugging me at the time, and that worry just seemed absolutely ridiculous and pointless and the great escape of things. I'd been given a, a glimpse to a different level, to a different state. For just, it wasn't like I said, it wasn't a very long time, I couldn't even time it, but it wasn't, wasn't very long, it wasn't like hours, it was maybe a few minutes of realization of, of the, the, everything that I thought I was, wasn't quite what it appeared to be. That there was something else, there was a different level to things, there was a different level of awareness. That self-observation was one part that led to self-remembering, and that triggered something completely different, another state altogether. We have to acquire this state of consciousness before we can move to the fourth state, the state of perfect illumination. Okay, so you can't jump from the state of pistis to the state of nous. You can't get to the fourth story of a house without going through the third story somehow, right? These are all connected that way. Uh, nous is also known as the state of Turiya, and the state of Turiya is the state of perfect awakened consciousness, profound inner illumination. That's the, the top of the ladder as far as the consciousness goes. This is the state of the being an awakened master. This is something that we're all striving towards, although few reach. The lowest part of man is irrational, subjective, and based or related with the five senses. Right? This is something that we talked about last week. The lowest part of who we are right now our information only comes through the five senses. Our perception of reality is based on what we perceive through the five senses, or more importantly, what the ego decides it would like us to perceive passed on through the five senses. Consequently, everything that we have is subjective. It's based on the ego. It's based on past experiences. It's based on where we grew up. It's based on what, you know, what kind of education we have. It's based on opinions and prejudices and theories and all that kind of stuff. So that's why we say it's, it's, it's irrational. The highest part of man, the highest part of consciousness, is the world of intuition and objective spiritual 
consciousness. Not seeing things as we want them and, and how we perceive them to be, but seeing things as how they actually are objective, being able to participate directly. Um, intuition, of course, we've talked about that before. Intuition is the information that comes to us from the higher dimensions. It's basically information that reaches us other than through the five senses. And consequently, intuition bypasses the ego. Now, the ego can override it, and many of us might get an intuitive hunch that the ego can easily override by questioning and reason and logic and that kind of stuff. But the highest aspects of ourselves, if we were able to awaken consciousness, the information that would stream to us about reality, it wouldn't be something we could touch, it wouldn't be something we could taste, it wouldn't be something we could smell, it would be something that we just simply knew. The reality that would come to us would be of an intu intuitional nature. We would just perceive the world and reality intuitively. It wouldn't be things we necessarily see or hear, it would be things that we just know. This you could think of the lower part of man is based on reason and logic. It's based on the ego and how the ego uses the intellectual center and emotional center and that kind of thing. The higher man doesn't use the ego to perceive his or her reality, doesn't use the five senses which we talked about last week are limited to perceive his or her reality, they use the intuition. They're able to communicate with the higher self at a much greater level and use that to define their world and reality around them. That's why we can't ever be told the truth. That's why the truth is something that we have to have experience because we have to have a mechanism in place in order to perceive it in the first place. The state of Turiya is most sublime and is only reached by those that work in alchemy because in the end we need the, we need the solar bodies. We need the solar bodies to awaken on those different dimensions because it's a through awakening with those different dimensions that we can actually incarnate the things that we need in order to reach this level. While we're fully ego, are, we're never going to reach this. We have to eliminate the ego and work on the solar bodies, and that brings with it the different states of consciousness. Now, we'll talk more about um, alchemy in later classes, and we'll talk more about the different types of bodies that can exist and the different dimensions that we can exist in. But in the end, while we're, we have all this ego manifesting, we're never going to be able to reach this. You could think of these, uh, like Ekasia, Pistis, Dianoia, and Nous, as the strength of the consciousness. We have to work to develop that consciousness. If we don't eliminate the ego, then the consciousness is only going to be able to be so strong. The analogy that we always use is we're about, you know, your average person is about 97% ego, 3% consciousness. And the highest state they can ever reach is the peace of state. As we start activating that consciousness, we're going to get glimmers of that state of dianoia, and eventually when the consciousness gets strong enough, we can resist, or not we can resist, we can exist permanently at that state of dianoia. And then we can grow that even further to then exist at the state of noose. It's all to do with developing the consciousness. Profound meditation is obviously a key and working with the, the energies, working with conservation of energies, working with transmutation and developing the solar bodies because the solar bodies become necessary to reach the state of consciousness because as the solar bodies grow and develop, we can incarnate higher and higher amounts of, let's keep it simple, let's talk about energy from the higher dimensions. We don't really have, we have all this potential energy we could harness, we just don't have anywhere to put it. When we start building the solar bodies, they become vessels for that energy of the higher self. So more and more of that energy can manifest through us. As more of that energy manifests through us, the more the consciousness develops. Once we reach this state of objective consciousness, we can see the world and things as they really are, which is the perception of the truth. We finally get to see the full perception of the truth once we've been able to, to reach the, the level of news. It's not until we get to that point and develop the solar bodies that allow us to reach to that level that we can really know what reality is and see things as they really are. We can know through direct experience the mysteries of the universe, the mysteries of life and death, all that kind of stuff is something that, of course, we're able to intuitively grasp. It's, it's, it's stuff that we really need the consciousness developed to be able to fully grasp these kind of things. During profound sleep, we can have glimmers of the state of vigilance. When we're asleep, we can sometimes have an experience of being awake. We call that a lucid dream, right? So you're at a lower level, and you can suddenly have a eureka moment where you go, aha, I was at this level, but now I'm at this level. That's what we would call a lucid dream, a sudden shift of consciousness from one state temporarily to another. Well, as what I described when I was sitting at my desk at work, during the vigil state, we can have glimmers of self-conscious. So from the lower state, we can have from the state of uh, Ekasia, we can have glimmers of the state of Pistis. 
from the state of peace this we can have glimmers of the state of dianoia and that was the experience I described at work and it felt uh, there were some analogies because I had a lot of lucid dreams before that obviously but there were some analogies where it was like this kind of feels like that that kind of wait a minute I'm somewhere different this is something different that's happening right now I'm sleeping yet this isn't a dream like I've ever what the hell is going on here it was a totally different experience but it's the same idea a eureka moment that suddenly things aren't what you think they are just like if you've ever had the uh, uh, the, the good fortune of having a lucid dream there you are in the dream and you just suddenly get this kind of wait that something doesn't feel right and then I'm dreaming this is different it's, you can experience something like that in the waking state as well whether it's through a meditation or like basically you're if you're doing a good deep self-observation, I'm going to call that a meditation because it's pretty much what it is, right? Um, from a state of good state of self-observation, you can have that same kind of wait a sec, something's not right here. I'm at a different level. I'm at a different vantage point. I was a dream. That was something different. I've now switched to a different uh, level of uh, awareness. And during the state of dianoia, during that self-conscious state, you can have glimmers into the state of noose. From one story of the house, you can always peek up into the next story temporarily to see what's going on, and then work towards a permanent, uh, permanent living on that particular floor, if you want to think of it that way. So that's interesting thing about each of these different levels that we have, is we can always, if we work, get a peek into what's higher. And once we've had that peek, then it allows us to discern the difference between the lower states, work towards developing that particular level, and once that level is fully developed, then we can get a peak in the next highest level as well. Uh, then from the different types of consciousness, the four levels of consciousness, uh, we're going to look at the different types of humanity. Um, I use man, but I mean humanity, man, woman, child, whatever, the different types of people, persons. Um, there are two types of people that exist on this planet. The first is called the mechanical humanity, and the other is called the conscious humanity. <clears throat> and of these two types, you can break them down into seven levels. So we've got two types, two groups, the mechanical and the conscious, and across those two types, there's a total of, of seven, sorry, across those two groups, mechanical and conscious, there's a total of seven different types. There's the instinctive or the mechanical person, there's the emotional person, and there's the intellectual person. We've talked about those before, right? Because those are the three brains. We said most people are either the thinkers, the feelers, or the doers. Okay, so we've, we've talked about those people before. Now this group of three, do you think they represent the conscious humanity or the mechanical humanity? Mechanical. Yeah, they're going to be your mechanical humanity, right? And that's where most of the people walking around on this planet are. They fall into the lower circle of humanity, the mechanical humanity, the thinkers, the feelers, and the doers. And we know the thinkers and the feelers and the doers, they're just defined by the egos and the energies that the egos are feeding on. The intellectual person really relies on the intellectual center and all the egos are basically feeding off that energy. The emotional person, the egos are feeding off the emotional energy and the instinctive and mechanical person, the primary balance of the egos is to feed off of the, the, uh, of the motor center. But there's different levels as well we'll look at. After this group of three, we see the balanced humanity or the balanced man or woman, the astral, the mental, and then the seventh level is the council man, the council human. Okay, so there's, of your two circles, you've got mechanical and conscious, you have then subdivide into seven different types. Mechanical, compulsive, instinctive, emotional, intellectual, balances the cross from mechanical into conscious, and then in the conscious humanity you have the astral, the mental, and the council. Okay, so most of humanity are going to be one of these three right here, but we're going to strive to transfer from whatever three we fit into, into developing the fourth aspect, and then going from the fourth aspect to develop the fifth, then the sixth, and then the seventh. So we're one of these three already, we want to become the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh as we, as we transition from a lower level to a higher level. And what we'll look at now is we'll look at each one of these levels in detail. In the instinctive person, the motor and instinctive centers predominate. The emotional person lives in the world of inferior emotions, passions, and animal desires. And the intellectual man reasons all day long. All his life he bases his activities in the intellectual center. We've looked at these before. The thinkers, the feelers, and the doers. You know, the people, the stereotypes, the people that are into sports and physical fitness and working out. The people that are, you know, more of the artsy music kind of. 
type people, people that like like watching you know movies and television and reading books about you know fantasy and science fiction and romance and drama and all that kind of stuff. And the intellectual men, there's the theorizers, the worriers, the rationalizers, the planners, all that kind of stuff. Remembering once again that it's not any one of these is better than the other. It's not better to be intellectual than emotional or vice versa. It's just that's the balance of egos that we have. Most of humanity is composed of those three types. So the majority of people you see walking around this planet will fit into one of those three categories. Together, now this is interesting, together these three types are known as the circle of confused tongues. They become, or they represent the Tower of, of, of Babel that was described in the Bible. Okay, the three types, the intellectual, emotional, and motor, they form the circle of confused tongues. These three types cannot understand or relate to each other, which causes many problems and is the source of much suffering in the world. And this is a cause of a lot of friction in relationships as well. And there was, a, I work at a, 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 a technology-based school, so it's no surprise that the majority of people that I work with were all intellectuals. But there's this one guy that nobody quite can understand. Nobody gets really a lot. It's not that we don't get along with him because he's a nice person. He's not mean, but he's difficult to relate to. He's difficult to comprehend. People can just keep bumping heads with this guy. Like nobody really understands what the deal with this guy is. And for the longest time, this always bugged me because he's a really nice guy. He is a nice guy, but I don't. Understand. I can't understand why he makes the decisions he does. I can't understand when he explains things to me. I just don't get this guy at all. And we all walk around the place going. Do you, why did he, what's the deal with this guy? Nobody understands him. It wasn't until I started learning uh, stuff about hypnosis, and it wasn't until I realized that I don't understand him because he's an emotional person. Because he reacts to things emotionally. He makes decisions emotionally. I'm using reason and logic, so of course it's this way. And he's, well, I want to do it this way. I'm like, well, why don't you do it? Why can't you see it like that? Why do you, you know, we just can't relate to each other. Um, I also can think of a relationship I had with a, a girl, and that was one of the problems in the relationship. She was an emotional person, I was an intellectual person, and we were just talking two different languages all the time. And we just couldn't relate, we just couldn't properly relate to each other. It was so difficult to see things from each other's point of view. Um, what was I going to say after that? Sorry. Uh, like, if you think of the different pe types of people in your life, um, when you think of somebody that... that if you're an intellectual, you see an emotional person and they seem to make decisions that aren't based on logic or reason or common sense. They seem to do something because they wanted to or because they felt like it or because it seemed right. They seem sometimes more uh, spontaneous, like they don't plan things and they'll just you know, randomly do something. And to an intellectual person or to an emotional person, an intellectual person can seem cold and detached and they don't take into account feelings and how other people might feel or react to it. They'll do something because it, it, you know, it, it, it saves money or it, it just it makes sense or it follows this you know, predetermined plan. Uh, intellectual people usually to an emotional or a motor person don't seem very spontaneous. Everything has to be planned out and accounted for and there's too many what ifs and what might happen and they seem very reserved. And um, you can probably relate to that yourself once you find out you know, what um, what one of the three brains you belong to, and you start looking at your best friends, we generally surround ourselves with people that we can relate to. So it's not unusual that our you know, significant other and our friends might fall into the same category, but we can't dictate who our family is, and we can't dictate who our co-workers are. Um, and sometimes we see that there are people in our family or our co-workers that we have a hard time. It's not that we fight with them, it's just we just really don't seem to... You can't understand why they do certain things. A lot of the people I work with, I know what they'll do. A lot of my friends, I'll know in a given situation how they'll react. Well, this will happen. He's probably going to do this. Emotional people or motor people, I don't know what they do. Why they do it doesn't make any sense to me. It makes true. What I perceive is very strange um, decisions. And that's where we get the, the Tower of Babel, where everybody talks a different language. The different language was the language of the ego, the intellectual versus emotional versus motor. And there's a lot of suffering and problems and friction and fights and even wars that are started because of the inability to perceive how other people um, will react to a situation or arrive at a decision. The balanced man is different. The balanced man does not identify with one center. When we're working on the path and we're working with self-observation and working to eliminate the ego, we can arrive at a different point. 
we can arrive at the balanced man, and that's where we correctly manage the five centers. One of the problems with being either intellectual or emotional or motor is remember we're creating a state of imbalance where we're always drawing on the energy of one center and not the others. I'm an intellectual person, I worry all the time, and I'm planning and I'm plotting, so I'm overusing all of that intellectual energy which is creating an imbalance in the center, so in order for the intellectual center to keep running, it's going to start drawing energy from the emotional center or the sexual center. So you've got you know, wrong types of energies ending up in different centers. That's a state of imbalance which causes a lot of the, the problems that we see in our psychology. When we work towards eliminating the ego and working with self-observation, we can then learn to correctly manage the five centers, which reads, and that's where the term balance comes from. We're using all the centers appropriately. We've rebalanced those energies. We're not constantly depleting one center over and over again, causing the energies to be routed around. When we learn to correctly manage the five centers, we're able to balance the flows of the various energies from the five centers. One of the things that does is it starts to develop a permanent center of gravity, a permanent center of consciousness. Because when we're either emotional, instinctive, or, or, or slash motor, or intellectual, what we're doing is we're always, everything's always shifting around. The ego's like the moving sand, right? It's the whole analogy of building the house on sand versus building the house on rock. Building the house on rock is a reference to, to the balance man, the permanent center of consciousness. Because when we learn to, to work towards elimination of the ego, the permanent center of consciousness, the permanent center, gra the permanent center of gravity becomes the consciousness, which doesn't change, which doesn't shift, which isn't going to react to something in our environment or another person and shift and move and become something else. Remembering that our personality is very fluid and dynamic. Once we learn to develop the personality properly by allowing the consciousness to manifest, we're not so fluid and dynamic anymore. We start to build that permanent foundation, which we call a permanent center of gravity or a permanent center of consciousness. To be balanced and create a permanent center of consciousness, we have to abandon self-consideration. We have to abandon self-sentimentalism. We have to abandon self-love, which really is that idea of the golden idol, right? Remember, if there's any golden idol we're all guilty of worshipping, it's the golden idol of the self, which is really the, the ego is the golden calf that we all bow down towards, right? To really create that permanent center of gravity, we have to do away with all of that stuff. We have to be prepared to really self-observe, to really analyze the ego, and be prepared to see ourselves as we really are. As the consciousness becomes stronger and stronger, we gain more ability to do that, to create that permanent center of, of consciousness, we have to give away that me first attitude to self consideration, self sentimentalism, and self love. We have to learn to put those things aside and be able to perceive things with the consciousness because self consideration, self sentimentalism, and self love that's all the evil, right? When we love ourselves too much, that should be a second over there, sorry. When we love ourselves too much, we hate others. And that's one of the problems that we have with relating with our fellow men is we love ourselves too much. I mean, one of my personal things when I was uh, first learning about Gnosis, the thing that I was wrestling with, is the idea of sacrifice to humanity, loving our fellow man. I was like, how do you, how do you love a drug dealer? How do you love like a <laughs> bum on the street? How do you love somebody that like you know smacks their wife around? Like, how do you? Like, how are you supposed to feel like something through all of these, this humanity? Like, I wasn't even really able to understand that. But it wasn't until I understood that the reason I found it so hard to love a stranger or somebody or somebody that had wronged me was I uh, loved myself too much. Well, how could you love a bum that just doesn't, he lives on the street, he's dirty and filthy? And it's because I've elevated myself above him. Because I'm better than him, because I have a job. And I work, and I don't know nothing about the guy. I don't even know how he got in that situation. And so many times there's, you know, a single few moments of instance in life, one wrong turn, one bad decision, that's all that separates us from the people that we despise and detest. You know, we did uh, one thing and fortunately karma allowed us to do one thing that it didn't allow that poor individual to do. In the end, we all carry the same, you know, seven deadly sins within us to some various degree. So no matter what horrible stuff people do, we're all at some level capable by carrying the same egos. It's not until we arrive at that point they're able to look at the bum lying on the street and 
you know, to, to not feel superior, to not feel better, to just to, to see it as a, a reminder to us of, of karma and how little separates us from that person because we all came from the same source. No better or, or no worse than anybody else around us. Um, and it's not until we're able to arrive at that that we can, that we can learn that lesson. The more one loves oneself, the more pity one feels for oneself, and the more one hates others, and the more one projects negativity towards others, because that's just uh, one of the things that we, that we do. The more, you know, that's the whole me first. I should have this, and I should have that, and you shouldn't have this, and this person shouldn't have that, and they shouldn't win the lottery, and I should be better, and I should get the raise, and I should get the promotion, and I should have a better car and a better house, and that's just one of the things that we do. And, when we don't have that, we feel bad for ourselves because we're not earning a million dollars a year. We don't have the BMW. We don't have the you know, trophy partner or whatever. And, you know, then we resent the world around us. We resent those that do. Not necessarily like there are those that do it consciously and will say that, but many of us, we just do it subconsciously. It's kind of always there in the background. The keeping up with the Joneses, the source of a lot of the materialism that drives our current society. When we hate ourselves, we begin to love others. Now, let me define that. I'm not talking about the masochistic kind of hate, like, you know, going home and whipping ourselves, kind of self-flagellation kind of hate, but recognizing our defects. Not hating ourselves, but hating the ego, which is different. Because inside of us, there's the ego and there's the consciousness. So I'm not talking about beating ourselves up or doing anything that would uh, uh, be damaging, or I'm not talking about having a low self-esteem. I'm not talking about that kind of thing. But recognizing that we carry defects, recognizing that, you know what, we are not perfect. To take that golden image and go, you know what, that is not true. That is not who I am. I'm no better than everybody else around me. We're all just one small drop pulled out of an ocean, and I'm not any better. There's really nothing about me that's better than anybody else. We have to accept that we're all mechanical. We are a mechanical creatures. We're a mechanical creature, or if you'd like, we are mechanical creatures. You can read that however you like. So I'll give you two more things there. <laughs> that one's life moves over the tracks of habits. One has to recognize that one is full of jealousy. We all carry the same ego. That's why in the Bible all of humanity carried the seven deadly sins. And if we, you know, he was he who was with, without sin was the one that was going to go into the kingdom of heaven, right? Remember, you just substitute sin for ego, and you pretty much have the exact same principle. Um, we all carry them. We've all, at some point, we've all lied, we've all hated, we've all, you know, like uh, Jesus would say, he who is without sin and cast the first stone. And we're all guilty. We're all full of these things. We have to recognize that, though, and stop building that, uh, that false idol and trying to hide and rationalize and cover up. Well, you know, you know, sometimes I've been angry, but it was because somebody did. You know, we always had that rationalization that allowed us to, to do that. When we recognize our defects, when we accept we're mechanical, we begin to form the conscious center of gravity within us. When we start to really through this, of course, comes through self-observation. You know, you're so sick of hearing self-observation. Um, it's self-observation allows us to see the ego, which allows us to accept that okay, the ego does exist, and that I am not perfect, and I'm, you know, I, I can. I'm just as guilty as anybody else for you know being negative or and you know inflicting pain or suffering on other people for, for no reason or whatever you want to discover within yourself, however that works for you. When we recognize that within us, then we start to see that you know what my life is just reactions. I just react to people around me. My emotions are reactions to situations. My fears are reactions to situations. Everything's just a reaction to a situation. When you begin to reach that to that knowledge. Not because somebody told you, not because you read it somewhere, because you've seen it in yourself. Then you begin to form that conscious center of gravity. Then you begin to arrive at the point where you can start to cultivate that position of balance. From this state, we can build our solar bodies and become astral, mental, and then council people. It's from this level that we really begin the work. We have to get through the stage of the first three levels and arrive at the fourth level, that of a balanced man, before we can really start uh, to work on the path. Because while we're in that state of imbalance, while the energies are shifting all over the place, while the egos are fully in control and we really can't perceive the reality of the ego, we're never going to be at the position where we can develop the higher bodies. That's why to reach the state of the balanced man is, is, is such an important aspect of this path that, of course, 
We get there through self-observation. We get there through self-remembering. We get there from really analyzing our own psychology, discovering the manifestation of the ego within us. The more we discover about the ego, the more we learn about the ego, the more time we spend with the consciousness. And so the next thing you know, we, we, we've got to know our consciousness. And it sounds silly, but once you get to know your consciousness, that's when you're becoming that point of balance because you're relying more on the consciousness and less and less on the ego. The ego is always shifting and moving, but the consciousness is the permanent, immortal, you know, uh, basically it never changes, it never doesn't, it isn't born, it doesn't die, it's just, it's always there. Which then, from the balanced person, the next level that we go to is the level of the astral man. The astral man lives in the astral world absolutely conscious. Okay, so it allows us to use the astral dimension consciously, and how is it we've done that? because we possess the solar astral body. When we possess the solar astral body, we can basically have conscious immortality in the astral dimension. Right now we have the lunar body. It's not a permanent vehicle. When we start developing with transmutation of the energies, we then can build the solar astral body. And with it, it becomes, a, it becomes we can use it just like we can use the physical body. We can do all the crazy stuff we've talked about, visit other planets, stay in touch with the conscious circle of the soul humanity that operates over the superior centers of the being. We can basically, we become immortal in the astral dimension. So if we pass on in the physical body, we're continuing the work at the level of the astral. We don't have to return back to the physical anymore. Um, we use the astral body just like we use the physical body. After the astral body, we'll talk more about these uh, later on in detail. And we'll talk more about developing the solar bodies and alchemy in detail later as well. But after the astral, once we develop the solar astral body, we then go on to develop the solar mental body. So we're climbing these rungs of the ladder by developing the different bodies. Right now we're at the bottom because we're either the emotional person, the instinctive motor person, or the intellectual person. The next rung of the ladder is the balanced person. The rung after that is to develop the solar bodies, the astral solar body, and then the next step, climbing up higher, is the solar mental body. And the person who's uh, developed a solar mental body, that's, that's why they're called the, the mental name, we're talking about the mental dimension. Remember the mental dimension is the other aspect of the fifth dimension? Remember the fifth dimension has two halves, you've got the astral and you've got the mental. And this we associate with, of course, the intellectual center. You sitting in that chair right now, you have a lunar mental body. That's where your thoughts come from. When you go in your mind and you think, you're working in the mental dimension. This is something that's you know you're quite good at. You're quite comfortable with. But the problem being, it's a lunar body. Through alchemy and transmutation, we want to turn that into the permanent mental body, the legitimate solar body. And it's said that those who develop the mental body, those who, who work on that solar body, is able to capture the entire wisdom of nature. So, of course, a different shift of consciousness coming with that as well. The next level yet is the Kelsal Man, climbing even higher, creates a Kelsal body and transforms himself into a solar man and a true man. And this is interesting because after we develop the Kelsal body, we're actually able to incarnate the soul. For the lack of terms, the Kelsal body is the soul. We, right now, within us, we carry a fraction of the soul, the essence. When we get rid of the, what we call the four bodies of sin, you've got the physical body, you've got the vital body, you've got the astral body, and we've got the mental body. We call these the four bodies of sin because together, once they're eliminated, once the ego's eliminated, they form the vessel that would contain the soul. So the incarnation of the soul is to develop the solar council body. You can think of that one. And then it gets more complicated because we'll look at the different levels of the curve much higher than that after a different class. But for lack of a better term, that's why we don't have the soul. We have a fraction of the soul, the essence, but that essence is trapped up and the ego's got control of all of this. When we eliminate the ego and develop the solar, um, vital, astral, and mental bodies, that's when we're actually able to incarnate the soul. The soul's just waiting to come down, we just haven't cleared space for it. We need to kick everybody else out of the car so the soul can literally manifest. And that's the problem is there's too many people in this box because this is the ego. And that's why they call this the four bodies of sin because there's one, two, three, four bodies across the first, the second, and the, or one, two, three, four, and the fifth dimension. Uh, that's all ego. 
we eliminate the ego, we get rid of the ego, then the energy, literally think of it like an energy, the soul is able to descend and, and occupy that space. And that's where we reach the level of the council name. That's kind of a weird thing. We don't really have to do anything to kind of get the soul that comes of its own. All we have to do is clear a spot for it. Fortunately, that's the hard part because we have to eliminate the ego and then develop the solar bodies. It's said that the soul can't come in because the lunar bodies can't contain the energy. It's like you're literally trying to put something big into a small container or imagine you're trying to fill a giant vessel full of water. You're trying to fill a swimming pool full of water but it's all cracked and old and rusted and you put the water in it will just explode. And it's said that if the soul tried to manifest in the physical body right now, that we'd literally die. We wouldn't be able to sustain the energy, the vibration, the shock. It's not until we build the golden bodies that we reinforce everything that we're able to actually take or receive that energy. So I guess the best way to uh, defeat your enemy mm -hmm. is to know your enemy. Mm -hmm. And um, the enemy being the different egos mm -hmm. that are seven, right? Uh, the seven deadly sins? Yeah, that's the way Christianity depicted it, but we have to think of the seven deadly sins as being like the seven generals in the army, each with a legion. So, um, so for, for Gnostics, then, the enemy um, can be uh, equated to seven deadly sins, in addition to uh, others, other egos? Well, we look... Those are the seven. We kind of, um, I don't know if I've done this with you guys yet before. Tree. Have we I did a tree? Yeah, did I talk about the tree? The tree. Yeah, remember the tree? It's going to look like a hand. It's not laughing at the tree. <laughs> you laugh at the tree. No, I'm One, two, three, four, four, five, six. six. So, that's the tree. We've got the seven main roots that hold it in, but the roots all have like offshoots of the roots and then they come off and they have all kinds of little roots on them. Those are all the various egos. So we look at this, like we look at, say, um, uh, uh, let's say we look at um, anger, representing one of the seven deadly sins. Part of that would be hate and racism and bigotry and all that would belong to all these kind of sub-roots, if you look at it that way. So a tree has seven main roots that form the foundation, but each of those roots has all various offshoots, if you look at it that way. So we could think of the seven deadly sins being, you know, the seven generals of seven armies. They'll have a legion at their disposal. That's why in the Bible, when we talked, um, no, when we talked down, when we talked about this, remember that the devil says he's a legion, right? He says, I am legion. Suggesting that he's not one, that he's in fact thousands, a whole army. And that's where we get that from. Mm. And then, so, um, to continue on with the biblical, or the religious analogy mm. of the seven deadly sins, you also have the seven cardinal virtues, which would be the, the remedy or the antidote to the seven deadly sins? Yeah, which would, I think is an analogy for the, the bodies in the seven higher dimensions. Yeah. So patience is the antidote to anger or wrath, mm -hmm. um, according to the, mm -hmm. if you look at the, the difference. Mm -hmm. So um, through cultivation of patience, you would um, destroy wrath, one of the generals. Eliminating anger. Yeah. And eliminate anger, and then be on your way towards mm -hmm. liberating yourself. And those seven virtues are like, they're like the seven aspects of the consciousness, you could say, versus the seven dark aspects of the ego. Like the, where the ego would be reactive, react with anger, the consciousness wouldn't react at all, which would be like patience. Yeah, that's what I, yesterday, um, my daughter, seven-year-old daughter, and my wife got into a big blowout. And uh, so I talked to my daughter, and, and based on the course, I told her, I said, you know, you have a monster. Inside, it's the monster of anger. And the way you want to destroy it is to stop feeding it. So mm -hmm. I told her, um, every time you get angry, you're feeding that monster that's inside of you. And kids, you know, they, they relate to monsters, right? <laughs> so, I think of my own mind if we told me had a monster or something like that. I would have reacted to that. Get it out, get it out. <laughs> <laughs> so she was listening to me really mm -hmm. carefully. Mm -hmm. And um, she says, okay, all right, I'll try to do that. And um, so it yeah, dawned on me that um, the, we feed these monsters. Oh, yeah. Um, and then, but if you stop feeding it, then it'll shrink in size until it becomes so small 
Yeah, and you instead, you know, think of anger and patience. If you, if you have the patience, you're resisting the anger, which means you're not feeding the anger, you're feeding the consciousness, which means the consciousness grows, and not the ego. Yeah. So that's what we mean by true man, is the ability to, to, to incarnate the soul. Uh, we need to elevate ourselves little by little from grade to grade, so climbing that ladder, to pass from the mechanical center of gravity to the conscious center of gravity, something only attainable through the third force, which is the work that we're trying to do, okay, the work of working with the birth, the death, and the sacrifice. It doesn't have to necessarily be the Gnostic birth, death, and sacrifice showed up in something else, it doesn't really matter, it's just a available at that point, we're only going to get there by working through those third factors. And it's not a case that we go to bed one night, we wake up and we're at some different level. It's, it's a work. It's passing from one level to another as we grow and develop along the way. It's like to pass from, you know, baby to child to teen to adult. That was a, that was a process we moved through. It just didn't automatically happen. We think of this the same way. It's a process that we move through that in the end has these distinct levels, but the transition from one level to another isn't distinct. It's like a continuous process as we shift our consciousness from one level, slowly moving it towards another level. And that's some, some cases we might have been trying to do that from lifetime to lifetime. Any questions about that? Okay. Uh, we'll continue. Oh. Um, okay, so uh, with the one analogy of uh, to hate the ego. Um, now, I was under the impression that it would be, like, let's say, for example, um, one starts to manifest an ego, I don't know, um, laziness. Okay. And then they get angry, psychologically, they get angry at themselves because they're manifesting the ego. No, if you're not uh, you're with, manifesting with the, anger. Yeah, that would just be another yeah, manifestation. Like that, the whole hate and quotation, oh, okay. quotation marks, because it's, right. it's not really that. Um, I guess I could have said uh, by not being so complacent and acceptive of the ego. You know, we learn to, to, to love others when we're not so complacent and accepting of our own defects and shortcomings <coughs> and negative aspects. But yeah, if you're not careful, and that is one of the dangers of this path. And I've um, and I've heard and I've I've read people on the internet that have uh, had negative experiences in various forms of, of Gnosticism, and some people totally overdo it and they hate themselves. They end up with a low self-esteem and they end up really depressed. And that's, that's, that's a risk. That's why you really have to, have to be careful because it's so easy for the ego to just say, to substitute one for another. Say, well, I'm feeling really lazy right now. I'm pissed off that I sat down and did nothing all day. You just, you just, one ego just transitioned into another. It's so good at that. It's something, that's why you work with that observation. You don't want to hear that, but that's <laughs> That's what it is to learn to differentiate and to recognize as you described it. Well, if I'm not careful, if I really want to not be content and happy with my ego, if I don't want to be complacent, if I'm not, gonna, if I'm not careful, then I'm angry or frustrated or this can be a whole other host of egos associated with not wanting to identify with the first set of egos. You know, just like if somebody's losing their temper and, you know, I don't want to get angry at them if I'm not careful. And this is something that I wrestled with. Um, you know, I'm a man and all that kind of stuff, and I didn't want to get angry at people. It felt like I was being a whip. You know, it's like I don't want to lose my temper at that person. I try to self-observe and not get angry, but that feels a lot like being a pushover. It feels a lot like being a whip, and uh, I should speak up for myself. And, uh, you know, that person was wrong, and I was so right. And if you're not careful, you go from one extreme to the other. It's able to find that left, right. It's that point of balance, the pendulum, right? The pendulum goes to one side. What? It, then it's going to go the other side, but there's a point, a very small point in between when it is neither left nor right. And that's what we're trying to do, trying to work that balance path. And in the, uh, in the East, they call that the Tao, right? The center of the circle. It's like you have the three pillars. You've got the pillar of severity, you've got the pillar of mercy, and in the middle, you've got the middle pillar, the path of balance. So the anger on one side is one swing of the pendulum, and it's so easy for us to react with something else that's just as bad on the other side. We have to learn to catch that middle, that point that's in between, that's neither left nor right, it's exactly in between. That's why I like clocks. I mean, last week I was talking about yeah. clocks at my house. Yeah. Um, that's why I just sit, and it sounds funny, I'll sit and stare at a clock and just watch that pendulum go, and just think so much of my life, my thoughts, my desires, my wants, my emotions are just like that damn pendulum, swinging one side to the other, perpetually going, how can I stop it right in the dead center? But even as a society, we do that. Okay. I mean, if you if you look at sure. politics and that sort of thing and the swing, right? 
So you can have, you know, a lean very much to the right where materialism and, and fiscal responsibility and blah, 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 and then you swing back to the other way, and it's to the far left and all that sort of thing. And when the most effective is when you get right to the middle and you listen to both sides and make a, mm -hmm. you know, a reasonable decision. There's a class coming up that we're looking at. It's called the Law of the Pendulum. And we find this is the way to describe it. That's not only the individual, it's like the entire society. It's one of those laws that governs that swing, and we see it all around us. That's why it's easy to get swept up in, in that mm -hmm. kind of thinking, you know? Yeah, there's a lot in of momentum. There's a lot of force that moves with that pendulum That's and right. it drags us around from one side to the other. Well, the thing, the thing with the pendulum and the example I'm talking about is that, especially nowadays, the two extremes, not in the middle, but the two extremes, shout loud. <laughs> You know, and, the people, and the people in the middle, <laughs> yeah. listen. Yeah. Right. yeah, and just kind of like, this one, this one, this one, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and we'll see that later on, that is not only in our society, it's not only in our, our culture, it's not only in humanity, in our race, it's also in our psychology and our emotions, and there's something called, like I said, the law of the pendulum that drives that. And it's, a, it's a really interesting class. Um, yeah, and it talks about the Tao and yin and yang and all kinds of stuff. Um, oh, protection during practices. Okay, so we're continuing where we left off. Um, remember that one of the things we want to do first is we want to cast out the negative forces in our exterior and interior environments. So we want to get rid of the stuff that's inside of us, like the ego and the negative aspects. That would be the interior. The exterior would be the stuff that's, like, say, let's say, in this room that's existing in the higher dimensions that we can't see, the negative stuff. Negative doesn't mean bad. It doesn't mean evil. It doesn't mean dark. It just means those forces counter to what we're trying to do. And that's something that's described as well when we look at the pendulum. We want to swing this way, but there's always going to be a counterbalance on the other side that wants to draw us back. We need to get rid of that counterbalance. Um, the, the funny analogy is, um, let's say we want to get rid of all the, uh, the, the hippies that are drinking beer and playing guitar in the backyard when we get home. So we come home and work one day and there's all these hippies in the backyard and we want to get them out of there. We need to cast them out, right? We need to get rid of the, the people that we don't want there. Uh, and we used the conjuration of Baileen to do that. That was that little, little mm -hmm. kind of chant that we do. Um, this gets more and more complicated, and there's various levels of doing this. And later on in the higher levels, when you get into phase C and beyond, you look at uh, there's very specific uh, forces that you can target and eliminate individually as well. This is kind of a, a general basic catch-all, because you're just calling in this, this positive influence to come chase the hippies out of your backyard. I don't know why I used hippie analogy, but it's what came to mind when I thought of people <laughs> being around that I didn't want to have hippies in the backyard. Bikers. Yeah, no, bikers. bikers. Okay, we'll yeah. go with bikers then. So look, you don't want as much bikers dr drinking beer in your backyard, and you don't want to look like you're the house with a girl up in your neighborhood, so <laughs> you want to chase them out. So you use the conjuration of Bailey to chase them out, which could be, uh, let's pretend that, you know, you start playing, I don't know, some easy listening music, which Classical. scares the bikers away. Classical, Classical. music Classical. like Classical. far yeah. around town. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 it works. Yeah. I love it. That's there you great. go. So <laughs> you keep creating the class music that makes the bikers go away. Uh, then you'd be better off putting up a fence around your backyard. Because if you put a fence in your backyard, then the bikers couldn't come back after you turn the classical music off. So we use the conjuration valley to cleanse the environment on an interior and exterior level. And then we seal the area off to protect the negative forces from re-entering. And that was the circle. And that's what we looked at last week, forming the circle and, you know, helium, malium, tetragrammaton, sealing the environment. Remember, we envisioned the three primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. We trace the circle uh, around the room. Um, if you've been in any kind of esoteric studies before, or read any kind of book on esotericism or practices or spells or magic or whatever, you come across a circle, whether it's physically drawn on the floor with chalk or tracing with a feather or an incense or smudging or whatever. It's all basically the same idea. You know, smudging or passing a candle to the four cardinal points is a type of a circle. Even though it's not saying draw a circle, it's saying, you know, you know, the feather to the wind and the flame to the whatever. I mean, it's all basically the same idea. Uh, then what you want to do is you want to invoke positive forces into the interior and exterior. So you get rid of the bikers, you put the wall up to stop them coming back, and then you invite a bunch of friends over. That's basically what you're trying to do. You get rid of the negative forces, you put up a barrier, and now you've created differentiation, which is what the circle is all about, defining space. You want to fill that space with something positive. Okay, so you want to get rid of the forces that are acting as the counterbalance to hold you back, and you want to tip the scale in your favor by invoking the positive forces, by calling down the, the things that will help us, by directing or becoming a, putting up a beacon, an SOS, a distress signal, so they don't, not the term distress, I mean like that, not a distress signal, but a beacon, just a beacon to the, the forces in the higher dimensions that want to help us. 
And to do that, we have something called the microcosmic star. I'm going to give you a handout. It looks, uh, it looks like a really big deal, but it's really not. It's just a couple quick, simple actions. And every time everyone looks at it, like, oh, that looks like a lot of stuff. I'll never remember that. <laughs> Um, it's really not that big of a deal. It's just I've gotten really wordy in my description. <laughs> you know. That's your intellectual thing. Yeah, absolutely. Precisely. <laughs> just trying to explain it all. Yeah. yeah. Blame so, it so perfectly. If you're emotional, you look at that and you're like, oh, that looks like a lot of stuff. I don't want to do all that. You're right. That's me. Take one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. It's not that big. Mm -hmm. Trying to pass that down? Sam, like you, I like words. Spell it all out. There you go. See? So that's me. I, sp I spell it all out. Um, do I need the next one for myself? <laughs> no, I know this one. I don't need that. Because I have it written down here. I don't need this. I'll go one for Okay. No, it's okay. It's okay. Oh, you, yeah, you know this too. You don't need that one. You don't need that one. She knows this already. She doesn't need this one. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, you know that. Sorry, sorry. Um, okay, the microcosmic star. Uh, what it is is uh, it's a it's like it's something that we're doing uh, as as like I said that distress signal, as that SOS, as that beacon. Um, it's something that we're doing with the physical body. It's a combination of something we're doing physically and mentally, which is forming something in the higher dimension. As funny as that sounds, um, there's an element of this we'll look at next week. But this is something like, imagine what the Catholics do, right? You see the Catholics doing this kind of stuff all the time. Yeah. That's something similar. It's a physical action that they're doing. People crossing their fingers. We have all these things that we do physically that are associated with different things that we want to happen. This is the same kind of idea. The microcosmic star um, takes advantage of uh, some physical actions that we're going to do to create something in the higher dimensions. We're literally creating a, a, a beacon, an SOS in the higher dimensions. It's going to attract some attention. So we start by standing uh, straight, our feet together, and arms crossed right over left, which is what we were doing last week when we did the yeah. whole conjuration of Baleen right before we did, the, we did the circle. Everything's right over left, and everything we face east, we move clockwise, we put it right over left, because it's all for the invoking the positive aspect of things. Um, people on the other path, the dark path, everything's done counterclockwise, everything's done to the west, and everything's done with the left hand. So I call it the left hand path, right? I don't mean that stuff at all. Uh, and then we're going to mentally pronounce the mantra clean. So you just, this is something mentally. You don't clean. actually say anything that's clean. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. a play all I have. Clean. While spreading our arms out like a cross, and with your left leg spreading out. That's me. Left leg? No, that's right. Right. It says right on your hand up, doesn't it? See, I rushed this one. Right leg, right That's yeah. yeah. yeah, right. Huh? So what I'm talking about is you're standing like this, yeah. and then you hit the wall. Stand like this, and then you move in like that. Because what shape am I making oh, right okay. now? That's a pattern of a Vesuvian man, yeah. right? Yeah. That's a, the, the oh, Vesuvian man. What's it called? I don't know what the, it's, the Vinci but one, right? The, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, because interestingly enough, we form the golden ratio, which is mathematically the same ratio as the pentagram. So if you took the ratio of the length of your arms to your legs, you create that equation, um, which is on the handout. It's the guy at the bottom right-hand corner. That's what we do. And if anybody does this, you're, you're making all these proportions mathematically. Now, um, because of Christianity, thank you very much, um, pentagrams are seen as something bad, right? So the idea of a pentagram is like, oh, that's kind of dark. Uh, and that's... There's some truth to that because um, uh, when, we, when we talk about pentagram, I'm talking about I'm talking about this kind of pentagram. Um, it's a five-pointed star, and the single point points up. That's what you look like, right? There's an inverse of that, and that the inverse of that is called the fallen man, and that would represent a man going. Yeah. There we go. Huh. That's the upside down pentagram. That represents the fallen man, the feet at the top and head at the bottom. And this is the one that you'll often see depicted as Satanism because if I made that a horn and that a horn and there's some eyes and there's some ears and there's a goat, you get that goat symbol thing going on, right? I'm not an artist, that's a bad goat. But anyway, better, better than it's not a good goat because then you know I'd be drawing simple things. Like it was smiling. Happy yeah. <laughs> but that's the one. That's the bad pentagram. Okay, the bad pentagram is the one that looks like you upside down. Imagine you're falling, like you know, falling to hell with your feet up. That's the bad pentagram. So think of a goat's head with the two horns up. The good pentagram is the one with a point on the top, and that symbol predates Christianity and predates the Christian cross. 
they've dug that up at, at sites all over northern England that go back like thousands and thousands of years, way before Christianity even started. So it's been one of those symbols that's been around forever. And mathematically, it's a really strange thing to study because there's all kinds of weird ratios. And it's funny, but that symbol, the ratios and proportions on a pentagram, in acoustic room design, we use those ratios. Because you know what? If you build a ratio, a room's dimensions and the ratio that's established by the pentagram, you get a really good sounding room. So it's one of those weird things that shows up all over the place. So anyways, yeah. so we start, you know, this, and then we go and we make the sound of the pentagram while we mentally pronounce the mantra clean. Um, I'm just going to go through all this. Oh, just so mentally. You've got, you've got this all in your handout, so let's just... I'll just it doesn't say mentally, it just says pronounce. Pronounce mentally. Dude, this all happens in your head. So you're starting okay. like this, and then you make the pentagram.